this really is a model that is worth picking up for their charm, for their looks, and for the fact that they can be fettled into a pretty reasonable runner. Hi there to you, welcome back to the channel here with me Jenny Kirk and we're up in the loft on Weir Yard and today we're going to be doing a box opening review of a locomotive that has been a stalwart of the Hornby range for a great many years, actually decades in fact, and it still does get released from time to time. In fact, this year there is two versions of this model that have come out, but it's not those that I'm going to be reviewing. What I'm actually going to be doing is taking a look back through the history of this model, and then I'm going to uh, be taking a look at my newest acquisition, which is the previous version. But of course, this model has remained unchanged since its inception into the range, but it didn't really need to change because actually back in the day, this was one of the finest models to be released in double O. So without further ado, and in association with our sponsor, Train-O-Matic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts, we're going to take a look at the Hornby X LNY Pug locomotive. Come with me, I'm really excited to show you these. <laughs> The story of the X Allen Y Pug is actually quite a long and complex one. Originally, this was uh, done by Daypole back in the, uh, I think it was around the late 1980s into the 1990s. And it was part of their range that they launched when they were uh, competing on the UK model market in 00. Originally, there'd been a model by Kitmaster, which had been a self-assembled polystyrene uh, type plastic kit and these were really really popular and for a good long time there's a lot of people went um, to great lengths to actually motorize these but Daypole then kind of wowed the market and you can imagine comparing these with what else was on the market they brought out a number of different versions so I'm going to start off by showing you some of those original releases and uh, one thing I will say is 51217 at the top there is actually a repaint so this actually started out as LMS 11217 uh, but it's become its BR identity but uh, just to see you're aware of that the BR version was 51241 and uh, they also brought out this beautiful Lancashire and Yorkshire livery version as number 19. Now, number 19 is one of the two that survive into preservation and she had quite a convoluted history. Originally sold out of service by the LMS Railway, uh, she went into industrial use along with a number of other pugs. Um, they still had life in them, so a number were bought up by industry. And she actually went through two different um, identities and sets of owners and ended up in a kind of maroon livery. And um, from that, she was bought for preservation. But I don't believe she's actually ever run in preservation due to how hard she had been worked during her industrial lifetime. In preservation, however, she has been cosmetically repainted, not just into the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway livery that you see here, but also the LMS livery, and indeed, she's even taken on the BR livery that she would have survived to become, which I believe was 51243. There are photographs of her um, painted up like that, as well as other long gone stable mates as well. The model itself has not changed over the years, but what happened in the 1990s was that there was a huge fire at Daypole's Chirk factory and it destroyed a lot of tooling, a lot of the records. And in the aftermath from that, Daypole uh, had to sell items from its range uh, in order to keep themselves afloat. And at the time, Hornby were looking to kind of modernize their range to compete with the uh, new arrival of uh, companies such as Backman that were producing a much higher quality model than uh, Hornby had been kind of resting on their laurels a little bit. So the opportunity arose to buy the tooling 
for the ex Lancashire Yorkshire Railway Park, as well as a number of others, including the N2, the uh, Hunslet J94 Austerity was another one, and a number of other items. So at that point, ownership of the tooling for these passed into the Hornby range, and uh, they really didn't hang about uh, putting them into production. And as part of that kind of great late 90s revival, they came back out again in a number of different liveries. So 11232 that I've got here, this particular pug uh, was the, I think this was actually, as far as my research has turned up, this was the very first release of it um, in Hornby ownership. And then it was very quickly followed up by 51218, which is actually the other preserved example, which was the final pug to be withdrawn. And um, actually, again, had a very interesting career. And there are a lot of photographs of this locomotive after being sold to preservation, being used around the Trafford Park area uh, because she was hired off for a couple of years to be used as a work shunter somewhere on Trafford Park to uh, earn money for the owning group. So quite a well-travelled locomotive. They also very quickly released two more pugs. So we got um, 51222 and this, as I think uh, long-time viewers of this channel remember, is the locomotive that got me back into railway modelling. Um, I always list it as being my favourite locomotive of all time. There are so many memories tied up with this and quite simply, it's a case that uh, I remember seeing this in Bolton Model Mart in the window. They had this very locomotive, brand new, and I thought that is absolutely amazing. I fell in love with this locomotive, went in, bought it, a couple of mineral wagons as well, and that marked the restarting of my love of railway modelling. After a great many years, having been out of the hobby since childhood, where I'd gone through uh, doing an awful lot of stuff with radio, a lot of music related things as well. But this locomotive just reached out and I, I just fell in love with its charm. Uh, and um, it's been a stalwart runner. One of the things that we will be showing you later on in the video is the DCC fitting guide. Now, this comes from uh, another video that we filmed a while ago about making these pugs one of your most reliable running locomotives in your fleet. And it can be done, but you can see there, one of the issues is you can still see some of the DCC decoder and the stay alive that this locomotive has been fitted with. Now you can hide it a little bit with uh, figures such as that, but if you do that, these do give some incredible performance on DCC. The pug story doesn't end there. There was another locomotive released in the same tranche as these, and uh, that actually carried the number 51235. What you'll find is that some of the BR numbers in particular do get reused by Hornby. They're not averse to bringing the same locomotive out again with just some minor detail differences. So 51218 would reappear, uh, as would 51235. So I'm just going to put these to one side, and I actually have the second release of 51235 here. And you can see here, this appears to be the only release that I've been able to find with the late crest, the BR late crest. These locomotives, the first two, I believe, were withdrawn during the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway ownership. There were 60 made in total. Really, really versatile locomotives. Uh, but um, throughout the LMS ownership, uh, a number more were sold, some into industry, and that includes number 19. But by the time BR ownership came around, I believe there was only 23 left in service, and they did get whittled down reasonably quickly. And uh, it's sad in a way that these locomotives don't, don't last in larger numbers, but they were replaced kind of like for like by the class two diesel shunter, which we're gonna be seeing forthcoming from another manufacturer. Uh, sometime over the next couple of years. And I guess a lot of the work that they were used for did kind of dry up. There was a lot that were used on the Liverpool dock system and uh, they really got quite far afield. Some got to South Wales during BR ownership around the Bristol area as well. 
Uh, right over to the other side of the country, Ghoul Docks, again, was another area that were a, um, a stomping ground of these locomotives. Now, this locomotive as well has been issued in factory weathered, and I particularly like the oily look that uh, Hornby did bring to these locomotives. It really does kind of make them. So I'm going to put that to one side, and I'm going to bring in here two more locomotives that they released. And again, factory weathered, number 51231, with the early crest this time. And uh, you can see there with the driver figure fitted. Now this driver figure actually comes in the box with them when you buy them brand new. And it is quite nice to paint it up and uh, be able to add it into the cab for a little bit of extra realism. A few Hornby locomotives in the range did come with driver figures, so it's just a nice little touch that you do get with these. Again, early crest, they had also introduced one with British Railways lettering, there's one I believe like that, and as I said before, I think that uh, 51235 and indeed 51218 were also um, issued with the late crest at various points in time. Another one here, 51232. Now this is a locomotive that when you see photographs of it, it always looks incredibly clean and uh, almost like a depot pet to me. And I got the impression when I was doing the research for this video that 51232 had been earmarked for preservation uh, in some respect. Uh, certainly it was well cared for by the crews that operated it and uh, you can see it in photographs on the internet in a very pristine turned out condition when other classmates even in the same photographs look absolutely filthy and uncared for. However luck was not with 51232 and she suffered a shared axle in Salford and uh, as a result was withdrawn and scrapped which uh, was a great shame for a locomotive that, uh, from the photographs at least, looks like it would have otherwise been an ideal candidate for preservation. This particular example, if you're wondering, is missing the boiler weight and the motor, and it is sat on a spare chassis that came from a different pug, which is why the cylinders don't quite match the weathering, but certainly it's one that I was more than happy to add to my fleet. In fact, 51232, does appear to be one of the most difficult to track down second hand. I've got one more pug to bring in now, again under the Hornby ownership, and this is 11250. Again, quite a tricky one to track down, although I actually bought this second hand in a model shop, so for me it wasn't particularly tricky at all. The LMS liveries do seem to have been much scarcer, but a number have come out over the years from that 11232 that is down there, the Daypol version of 11217, and then this version 11250, one of the very, very late numbered locomotives. It's quite interesting that 11250, for some reason, doesn't appear in any of the lists of withdrawals that I can find. It does seem to be that um, I just couldn't find out what the fate of this locomotive was, whether it even lasted long enough to get its BR number. But that was, again, quite a late release by Hornby, and all went quiet on the release front until this model turned up. And this I've managed to track down secondhand, R3024, BR Pug, number 51240 and this is not the most recent release that one carries the running number 51207 but I haven't actually tracked down one of those as of yet but this model is in such perfect condition that I thought it would be great to uh, share this with you. So you can see here it comes in the fairly standard Hornby box I'm guessing that the price was its original price I bought this second hand and in fact I'll get to it in a moment there was a lovely note in the box I bought it through eBay uh, but the eBay seller actually recognized who I was and put a uh, really nice short note in so I will give them a name check when we get inside the box. I'm um, going to open this up and it's the um, the big polystyrene boxes, these are something that hasn't changed a lot over the years. Uh, and what's interesting about these, I always find, is that Hornby 
release them with this insert with a kind of a line drawing of the locomotive and I would think that uh, it's something that it would be much nicer with an actual picture of the locomotive even if this was the artwork but coloured in it would just be a nicer way of presenting it. But here is the model in its big block of polystyrene and I suspect that the newest version of these models have finally dispensed with the polystyrene uh, but this is in absolutely mint condition. i uh, just show you this as well. This is the extra separate detail bag and you can see there that driver figure which uh, if I just look over here for 51231 has the very same driver figure in um, but he has been painted up using Humbrol enamels in this model. So you can see the effect you can actually get. We've also got a few lamps in there as well. In fact, actually quite a lot of lamps and some uh, discs as well, which you can add if you so choose. But again, these will all need uh, painting. Now, I've already gone ahead and DCC fitted this because my layout is DCC. Um, but as they come from the box, none of these locomotives are listed as DCC ready. And it's something that I have actually sent Simon Kohler an email and I did get a response from him, um, which kind of uh, hinted that maybe they are considering um, just updating these to be DCC ready, but it gave absolutely nothing away. So what I would say is, Never play poker with Simon Cola because he has one heck of a great poker face. Um, but certainly this locomotive is a really easy DCC fit. And we're going to add in some details of how to do that taken from an earlier video that I've done on the channel. The cab itself is held on by two clips either side plus a further one at the back. So we just gently squeeze in and lift. And that entire cab assembly comes off in one neat piece. And then what you can see in there is that we've got the connections to the motor on the top. And then we've also got these connections up from the pickups. So it's really, really simple. There's not really a lot in here at all. This um, capacitor or transistor, whatever this is, that's going to go. Don't worry about that. We're going to get rid of that. But then effectively, we're going to have to fit within this space inside the cab the entire gubbins of the Smart Power Pack and decoder. So I've got my Trinomatic uh, Smart Power Packs here. We can disguise them afterwards um, using some maybe black colored card just to uh, obscure the electronics. So when you look in through the side, you're not going to see that. This is the chip that uh, I've chosen for this, and this is the Trainomatic 8-pin decoder. You can see it comes on uh, a set of fly leads that lead to the 8-pin plug down there. It's standard NMRA wiring, so what we're going to do is we're going to trim off the plug, trim back the wires to just the length that we need it, and we only need four of these wires. So we need the two wires that go to the pickups, and the two wires that go to the actual motor. Uh, but uh, before we do that, what I actually want to do is put this aside, and I'm going to wire the smart power pack to this as a test that everything is up and running. And then what I can do is I can plug the 8-pin decoder socket into a regular locomotive and just make sure that that smart power pack is soldered in properly and all working before we start working on that. So you can see on the back there that we've got these little solder tabs and it's these three at the bottom that we're going to be soldering the smart power pack to. So I'm going to bring in the smart power pack here and you can see it comes with three sets of wires and these are color coded white, red and black. And on the uh, Trainomatic website, it gives you the full wiring diagram for uh, where you need to solder these two. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, first things first, I'm going to tin those little tabs on there. You've got to do this really carefully because you don't want to bridge the solder across those, otherwise the chip will just stop working. It all is not lost if you accidentally do that. Uh, all you need to do is clean off the solder and the chip should be just fine. But it's just something 
to watch out for. Once we've tinned those three tabs there, then I'm going to trim the wires on the Smart Power Pack to length, tin them up too, and then it's just a case of very, very carefully soldering them to the tabs on the decoder. Now I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, it's not something that's going to be easy for me to film and solder at the same time, but I'm going to come back and I'm going to show you the end result. So one of the first things that I've done, you can just see there that I've removed the heat shielding over the three tabs that we're going to need to solder to. It's okay to just remove it in that small area, leave it intact on the rest of the chip to protect various things. Just use a very sharp craft knife, something like that. Don't cut too deeply. You don't want to cut into the actual decoder itself because you might run the risk of severing some of these copper tracks. But it's quite easy to do, and then you just peel the unwanted piece off, and that exposes those tabs ready for tinning with solder. So they're now tinned, just a very, very thin layer of solder, making sure that you don't bridge any of those gaps in between. Otherwise, as I said before, you'll find that the chip stops responding. Can be revived if you do that by removing the solder, but really you'd just be making work for yourself. Now we've also tinned the ends of the wires, trimmed them first, tinned them up, and then following the guide on the Trainomatic website, we're going to now very carefully solder each of those to these tabs. I would recommend start at one end and move along one at a time, whichever way is easier for you. If you leave the middle one till last, you're just going to run the risk of unsoldering the others as you do it. You don't need to apply too much heat because that's tinned, because these are tinned, you'll probably find they'll just instantly stick. Whatever you do, don't keep applying heat, otherwise you might run the risk of overheating the decoder. And the end result you're going to get is there, like that. Now my soldering's not the neatest, but it gets the job done. So the next step is, we've still got the 8-pin plug on this decoder, and this is going to be the easiest way to test that everything is okay. So what I actually have for this job is uh, I have an old 8-pin chassis here. This is actually off a Helgen Class 17. It's a known working chassis. And I can just plug this in and test it on the layout. And that will tell us that the Smart Power Pack is all set up as it should be. So I'm going to go ahead now and let's get this tested. So we've got the setup here and you can see the uh, chips just hanging off there. And that's fine. So what we're going to do is up on here, we're going to go to the program track. We're going to read the address. And this should be the default of three if we've got everything right. So just give it a moment to uh, have a think about that. And there we are, loco number three. And that hopefully means that we've got that soldering all set up just right. This tells us that that is absolutely fine. The only wires that we need on this is uh, orange and grey, they connect to the motor, and red and black, they go to the track. And uh, so everything else, we can trim those wires right back if we need to, if uh, space is going to be an issue. So I'm going to get on, I'm going to get them ready. And then, of course, as well, we're going to prep the locomotive. And uh, the easiest way to do this is I'm going to unsolder to those tabs at the top um, and then the, the wires that we need to go to the motor can just solder straight onto there, nice and neat. And then uh, I will have to solder to these wires and we use a little bit of uh, black tape just to uh, cover up the solder to make sure it doesn't uh, short out on anything. And then we're going to try and get it all fitted into that cab. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Here we are. We've got uh, those contacts all soldered off. So we're pretty much ready to go there. Um, so red and black go to the track. Orange and grey power the day. Well, that's how I'm remembering it. Um, there's probably a good um, a rhyme to help you remember, but that's that's how I'm doing it. So without further ado, let's get it all soldered on. So I've got it on the test track now, and the reason for this is that if we've made a mistake uh, testing it out on the test track, um, it's not going to run the risk of damaging the, uh, the processor on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up read on the programming track, and this is just a really good way of just making sure 
that this comes back as the um, ID number that we were expecting. So um, hopefully it should come up as 5122, and there it is, 5122. So the fact that it's read that back OK, hopefully now means that we're good to test this on the track proper. So I got it on the track and got it uh, selected. So let's give it a little bit of power and just see how it does. Well, that's actually a lot better than the other one did. 51240 comes with the BR Early Crest, and it is really quite nicely rendered on the sides there. Both of the crests faced forwards, and I believe that British Rail got in trouble with the College of Heraldry over this, because effectively they amounted to two different crests when they only had the right to one of them. So um, I suppose that was then corrected when they went to the BR Late Crest. We've got the number there on the smoke box door, and we've got a shed code of, I'm just looking there, 26B it looks like. For a model that actually dates right back, it's still pretty crisp on the moulding detail. There are a number of separately fitted details. We've got the metal handrails, chemically blackened, and they do look nice. And we've also got an LMS works plate on there. Even though these were built by the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway, the LMS were great ones for kind of pretending that it was them all along, even though it was one of their constituent companies. We've also got a great rendition of uh, detail beneath the saddle tank there as well. And then one of the areas which I always find a little bit peculiar is that the crosshead there and the piston slides are completely enclosed. But uh, I'm not entirely sure how prototypically accurate that is. These models do come with dumb buffers and all of the photographs that I've seen of uh, the pugs show them with these wooden dumb buffers. Although the old Kitmaster kit strangely did come with more regular buffers. Now the cab on these is held on by three little clips underneath. And if you want to remove the cab, pushing on the back, pushing on the side, pushing on the other side, and then give it a wiggle and the entire cab comes off. And you can see there that we have a motor in the cab. It's quite a simple motor, drives the rear axle via a single worm gear. And uh, when you come to DCC fit it, here fitted with a Trainomatic 8 pin decoder that's been adapted to fit, it is actually quite easy to just solder them in. In the cab as well, we have this brake standard too, which is a nice little touch, I have to say. Behind the motor, which is fitted in through a single screw at the bottom, which also helps hold the chassis in, there's also a lead plug in the boiler, which is what the chassis screws to, and it does give a reasonable amount of weight to this model. The cab itself has uh, clear glazing in, but uh, you can see there it sits in the roof, but actually from normal viewing angles, it does look pretty reasonable. Whistle on the front is a separately applied detail, and we do have a few other little bits and pieces. The rivet detail too does look really, really good. And the pug has this very strange, and I have seen it in photographs, so it is prototypical, this kind of board on one side. But my thoughts are that it might have been improved to have had it on the other as well, because it would have helped to disguise the motor. Running characteristics of this locomotive are actually pretty good especially when you consider that it is an old model with a, a near enough direct motor drive to wheels just via that worm gear, and also that it's a very short wheelbase 040 chassis. It does perform really well, and uh, one of the things that this locomotive will do is go around some really tight curves. Just like the prototypes, which were intended to work some tightly curved dock lines, they actually have a smaller wheelbase than some of the wagons that they would have been tasked to shunt. I've actually found that with the Stay Alive fitted, these run pretty much as one of the best locomotives in my fleet. And it's a pleasure to be able to bring this venerable old veteran of the Hornby range bang up to date and make great use of it on the layout that I've got up here in the loft. On to scores. For finish, delivery is a reasonable representation, but it is a little bit basic. However, that is, I suppose, in keeping with the full-sized locomotives. The application that is here is quite crisp and sharp. 
The lettering on the cab sides is really nicely done, and I particularly like the use of this slight off-white, which really does look the part. The works plates are actually reasonably legible when we zoom in on them, and you can actually read the LMS, the build date, and Horwich locomotive works, which is where the prototypes came from. I particularly like as well the blackened handrails, and this is actually quite a marked contrast from the old Daypole version, which if we show it here, you can see that the handrails were not so coloured and do stick out an awful lot more. When we compare the uh, actual running gear as well, it's a great step up that Hornby have chosen to chemically blacken not just the wheel treads, but also the connecting rods too. And this really does improve the locomotive dramatically. So for finish, I think it's probably a good solid seven out of 10. When it comes to functionality, the locomotive does run reasonably well, albeit with its very short wheelbase imposing a few restrictions. If you have insole frog uh, points, and diamond crossings, you may find that this locomotive is prone to stalling. And that's one area where a DCC fitting with a stay alive really does bring out the best in it because it'll just help it over those little dead spots. I also found that the motor gearing is very, very high and it makes it a lot more difficult to be able to control this model. It does feel at times like it's trying to give a Smoky Joe chassis a run for its money in the speed that it can achieve. But other than that, for a model which is pushing 30 odd years old, it is actually a pretty good stab. And I'm gonna give this 7.2 out of 10. Ease of use. The model itself does not come DCC ready. Indeed, it's one that whilst it can be fitted, as you can see there in the cab, the cab does end up getting filled with the DCC decoder, which is a little bit of a downside. I would say though that there's probably not much space that you could have hidden that chip away, although right up there in the cab roof above the motor block, if Hornby were minded, something like a proprietary six pin interface up there at the front of the cab, with the chip being able to be plugged in as a direct plug chip held up on the cab roof would certainly go a long, long way to address some of these issues. So for ease of use, I'm gonna give this a 5.2 out of 10. When it comes to aesthetics, this locomotive really does capture the charm of the prototype. It really is a small locomotive and don't let the fact that I've got to hold this quite close to the camera actually give you an illusion that this is a big piece of kit because it is not. You can see there it fits really quite comfortably in the palm of my hand and really when you consider how old the model is it really is something that still holds its own even now. So for aesthetics I'm actually going to give this an 8.9 out of 10. Value for money. On the second-hand market, you can still pick these up in mint condition. I found them from between £20 up to about £40 seems to be the going rate for them. Brand new from Hornby, they are still fairly reasonably priced and you can still find them in the shops for probably around the £60 mark brand new in their most up-to-date guises. And actually, this really is a model that is worth picking up for their charm, for their looks, and for the fact that they can be fettled into a pretty reasonable runner. So value for money, I'm going to give these a 9 out of 10. That gives us a final score of 37.3 out of 50, which might shock some people as being an unusually low score. But what actually brought this locomotive down is its lack of DCC ready connectivity. That means that unless you're fairly confident with a soldering iron, this is something that you would have to turn over to a model shop or a friend to DCC fit. And in this day and age, I think that this is really an open door that Hornby needs to push at to make this locomotive proprietarily take a DCC decoder, it would go a long way to raise those scores. But as for the rest of it, this model really did hold its own and I can wholeheartedly recommend it. 
it's one of my favourite locomotives in the Hornby range. And actually, when we go back to my 51222, this is the locomotive that I can thank for getting me back into the hobby. Without its charm and its appeal, would I really be here? I'm not sure. Model Railways is the hobby that does always keep bringing you back in. But certainly this little locomotive will always have a place in my heart. And for that reason alone, I say get yourself one of these models. You won't be disappointed. I'd also like to extend a big thanks to John, who's on RM Web is ADB96808, as he was the individual that I bought this from on eBay, and he recognised who I was and put that little note in and says, Hi Jenny, enjoy the pug. I hope to see it in one of your videos someday. Well, here she is. She's gone to a good home. Well, I hope you found that video informative and it just goes to show that these locomotives are actually a surprisingly easy DCC fit and uh, you can fit in the Stay Alive as well. You can check out at the links down below where you can find yourself the up-to-date version of the LMY Pug and also check out the Trainomatic links and you'll be able to pick up as well the DCC decoder and the Stay Alive that I used in that DCC fitting. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and also you can head on over to Patreon and help support the channel if you so wish to. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, say you take great care of yourself. It's been great to have your company. I'll see you again. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video is sponsored by Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders designed to be fully compatible with every manufacturer's locomotive. Visit train-o-matic.com to browse the full range and see what they've got suitable for you. I'd like to send out a huge thanks to everybody who supports me on Patreon. And an extra special huge thanks goes out to Anthony Kidson, Michael Churchwood, Anthony Hunt, William Wade, Wayne Johns, Offshore Allen, oorail.co.uk, Tepic, Michael Lockie, Helen Sink, Peter Bolton, Brian Smith, Brian and Dorothy Mudd, Gary Lewis, David Quinn, Trish Bits, Sparky 107107, George Butterini, Andy Finch, Chris Moss, Robert Sears, MD of San Juan Model Company and Grant Line Products, Sam Yates, and Dale Williams. Thank you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this.